Thanks everyone for joining. We're excited to have you here again and very excited to have our good friend Vance McCoy uh, as our re featured regeneratively regenerative seed grower, I guess, uh, is the term that we're putting on this. So Vance, thanks for joining us. Uh, Vance is from Elsie, Nebraska. Now, if you don't know where Elsie, Nebraska is, you're not really a true Nebraskan, right, Vance? Everybody should know <laughs> where that's at. Very small town, what, probably about an hour southwest or so of North Platte. Uh, so out in some pretty yes. tough conditions. We had John Hearman was on last week. Uh, would be similar environmental conditions to John. Pretty, pretty harsh, arid uh, type area. So you know, when Vance is talking about his operation, he's doing this uh, under limited moisture, limited precipitation, which which he'll talk about it. But that's where oftentimes regenerative practices show up the best because uh, they they do allow you to take advantage of the environmental conditions that you get. So we've known Vance for quite a few years. Uh, Vance uh, has been a great seed grower. You can see that beautiful crop of uh, buckwheat in his background there. Uh, he's grown that for us. We've also gotten hairy vetch from him, cereal rye from him, and he'll he'll kind of go through uh, how he grows all those things in the context of his whole farming operation out there in, in western Nebraska. So, uh, Vance, I, I think I'll let you take it from here. I'm going to hide my video so I'm not distracting people, and then when you're done with the presentation, I'll jump back on and uh, we'll we'll have a discussion. Okay, thanks, Keith. Um, thanks for having me on, and and thanks for everyone that joined. Um, I'm going to turn on my screen sharing here. So, as Keith said, my name is Vance McCoy. Um, I am from Southwest Nebraska. Um, I am about um, 60 miles from the Colorado border and about 70-ish miles from the Kansas border down here in Southwest Nebraska. So, um, uh. Grew up on a farm, family farm here, um, and uh, I say I've been farming for over 30 years, it's possibly been longer than that. Started helping out on the farm as a kid. Um, we had irrigated crops, and then uh, as I moved into my own operation, we have irrigated and non-irrigated crops. Um, some of the crops that we grow are, you know, the standard corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, but then a few years back, oh, about 2012, 2013, we had the last drought we had, uh, just started looking at the need to, to uh, do some things different. And uh, so just started uh, slowly trans transferring into no-till and uh, um, more um, just uh, trying to find ways to save water. We used a lot of water that year um, and with not a lot of reward from it. So anyway, um, that's just kind of an introduction of myself. Um, and another thing that made me really look into regenerative farming, you can see my picture there. I'm standing in the cornfield. That's probably about 50 yards from my front door um, out, out in the cornfield. We we literally live in the middle of a cornfield. Our, our, it's a pivot irrigated quarter and the, the pivot wipers around the house. So um, that is uh, just a big reason that uh, we started looking at doing things different. So I guess for me, um, so I'm here to talk about regenerative seed and some of the regenerative practices I do. So I feel it's important to kind of uh, define what, what regenerative means to me and, and uh, what I think it means in general. And so here's a picture of a starfish. I'll just never forget was, I think us fifth, sixth grade science class. And they, they were telling us how a starfish can, can regenerate from some pretty severe like uh, you can cut off one limb and it'll regenerate from that. So that's something that's always kind of stuck with me is uh, so the idea is that, you know, something's been pretty severely damaged and uh, that it can, that it can uh, naturally uh, uh, heal back from that. And so I kind of look at our soils the same way. Um, we've, we've done some damage to it over the years and, and I can't point fingers at previous generations. I mean, I've been farming for over 30 years. I've, I've done a fair amount of damage myself uh uh probably first on the list of, of my uh, uh things that i've when i first started farming out was we were using way too much water and uh really didn't uh didn't take into effect the uh the consequences that that was going to bring down the road so that's one of them my, my biggest uh biggest 
concerns um, for wanting to turn this thing around. Um, so, you know, uh, so the, back to the, st the story of the starfish, you know, if, if you take him, take that, that damaged starfish and go throw it out on the interstate, you know, it's not going to regenerate. Um, you gotta, you gotta take away the, take away the cause of the damage. And, and so we've, we have a lot of disturbances, um, some that we cause and some that are caused by nature. Um, but a lot of disturbances, um, out here or anywhere for that matter on farming. Um, so, you know, our soils are that way, uh, they're damaged, um, too much disturbance from tillage, uh, chemical fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, and fun fungicides. But another one I think that doesn't get mentioned a lot is just the traffic. Um, you know, raising high yield corn, there's a lot of traffic out there in the fields hauling that hauling that out, you know, and their equipment gets bigger and bigger all the time. And, you know, so the, the compaction of that. And so that's one of the things that really helps. Um, you know, I say that raising crop, uh, seed crops um, for cover crop seeds is kind of a tool that I use to uh, to actually regenerate um, just to uh, uh, lower some of that that traffic out there um, so so in that um, we do a fair amount of seed cleaning um, just so here's here's a spiral separated running that um, I am separating, um, in this case, I think it's cereal rye and hairy vetch. And uh, it's a neat machine that I use quite a bit. Um, I really like raising um, uh, multiple crops, uh, at least two together, um, just for the, like in this case, the cereal rye helps the, the uh, Harry Vetch to trellis up on. And as Keith mentioned, that's one of the crops that I do raise for, for green cover is the Harry Vetch. And uh, so that's just some of the equipment we use. Here's another one. Um, this is just a small clipper style cleaner that I use to kind of clean stuff up, pre clean. Um, it'll go through this machine and then I actually put them in reverse order, I guess. It goes through this machine and then gets put through the spiral sometimes multiple times to separate out um, the two crops. Um, it's pretty difficult to set a combine for two different crops. So I get some extra extra dirt and stuff in there. And, and uh, um, so th these machines really help, help with that. Um, just, I'll, um, mention a lot of the tools I use and you know, all some are some of them are actually equipment and some of them are uh, actually a, a system a way of doing things and and these are a combination of that where I'm using multiple species crops and um, it really helps to reduce the amount of uh, uh, herbicides and, and and things like that that we need to use and I'll get into more of that as we go so here's an example of two crops together um, I did this for green cover a few years back. That's Elbon rye and then some wild winter peas planted in between the row. Um, this one was, uh, for whatever reason, the, the peas looked great coming into spring. And then as, as time went on, they just, they just didn't do well. Um, I really think it had to do with, there was a week in uh, like the second week of May that year where we had, freezing temps and over hundred degrees on the same week. Um, but anyway, this is something I want to mess around with more. I had a small strip in there where we um, actually ran out of seeds. So we planted some wheat and it did really well with the wheat. So that's something I want to look at in the future is, um, you know, different things that we can relay crop or companion crops together that will uh, really help. But you know, this this case here was no um, no herbicides from the time that rye, you know, from the time that those soybeans. This was an irrigated crop. Those soybeans got sprayed in the summer. You know, the last time those got sprayed, then then it didn't get sprayed again until um, I used the desiccant on the on the. Well, I harvested this and then went back in with buckwheat, and then we used the desiccant on the buckwheat um, because we just couldn't get a. Uh, killing freeze that fall that we needed so um 
but you know, in watching these this series and from the other, some of the other stuff I'm learning, I'm, I'm really wanting to learn how to use um, to raise these crops. Some of these crops I'm using to descant the the hairy vetch is one. Um, but you know, in, in watching what John John Kemp says about you know how that can affect the uh, the biology on that seed, um, so I'm I'm only looking for ways to uh, to eliminate that. And uh, we'll we'll be working on that in the future. So, so here a lot of crops, a lot of these concepts overlap. Um, so here's a cash crop um, where I put corn, and I planted those. I planted cereal rye, and I, I think this was a, a mixture of cereal rye and wheat, and possibly oats. I don't remember for sure, but um, planted this in a twin row configuration, a ten inch drill, plugged every third row. So that we have a blank spot to plant our corn into, and uh, then that gives. I'm I'm really working on getting ways to more of a a relay where you're actually having two crops grow simultaneously, and then like this this will get turn this got terminated after the corn was up and growing. So um, that works on some of my more conventional ground. Um, a lot of my ground I'm I'm using a non-GMO corn, so that that doesn't work there, but. So but just one of the things that kind of overlaps this this whole thing's a system. It uh you know, the regenerative part just doesn't stop with the seed or stop with the cash crops. It it continues clear through. And uh one of the things that's really helped me to do um with raising these seed crops is some of the benefits of a of a cover crop continue on uh completely after even after you harvest. Um, one example, I guess it'd be hairy vetch. You know, I've got some some hairy vetch and rye growing right now that I, that I didn't have to plant. It was from a previous year's crop. And, um, you know, cover crops, I get that a lot where I'm cover crop sales. Uh, I get a lot of comments how they're too expensive and, and it's hard to get a return on them. And, and so these, these are some ways that I get a return out of cover crops. So here's another concept that I've messed around with, and, and this was dry. We had the last three years in a row, we had you know, half our, our average yearly rainfall is is 18, 19, 19 inches. And uh, we have anywhere f our high in re the last 100 years, a little over 100 years recorded, recorded, our high was 35 inches and our low was like eight or nine. So we can get anywhere in that range. And so the last three years in a row, we've been around that eight to 10, um, three years in a row. So that little video I ran there was me drilling. Uh, so that crop was corn in the spring and it got hailed out. So I went in and planted a multi-species cover crop. And I went in, um, then we bailed it off. And then that lower right picture there is actually the wheat that I drilled that, that I was drilling in that picture. And that's a picture of it just uh, oh, probably three or four days ago. And it's just, this was in very dry conditions. So it's just kind of there again, shows how, you know, the regenerative system can be, um, it, some of the stuff even works when it's too dry, that shouldn't even work. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the video there, there was just hardly any dust behind the machine um, and you know, it, it was dry. So um, just kind of amazing. Some of those concepts We're just, we're just really trying to eliminate, eliminate chemical use. I'm not there yet. Um, we're still in the, get the starfish off the interstate mode. Um, but anyway, so there's uh, an example of just one of the ways that we're trying to kind of relay crop or, or uh, you know, there was no chemical used on that either after the corn, you know, after the corn herbicides. So, so here's another example of something we're doing. I, I raised this crop for oats and I harvested the oats for seed. Um, and when I planted this in the spring, I put in, I put in a brassica mix with it. And I had some, some other, I had some legumes in there that didn't make it. But here again, we were in pretty severe drought. We harvested a decent, we had some some moisture in May, June, which we typically do. And uh, it looked really well, really good. And then uh, after harvest, we just let this cover crop grow. So, you know, just a kind of a companion cover crop and then don't have to go back in there 
And uh, so this this is one of the things we're doing to really uh, try to try to keep the soil going, uh, keep the living root in the ground at all times. It's a little harder on our non-irrigated land than some of our irrigated, um, where you just don't get the rain. Um, had I probably had I come in there and tried to drill something after oats, I wouldn't have gotten a stand because it was just after oats harvest it got extremely dry and and I don't think we would have germinated anything. So just some of the concepts I'm using that, that fit with our cash crops and our and our cover crops that we're raising for seed. So how I choose some of the cover crops that we're raising for seed, first of all, he's got to want it. And uh, second of all, it, it kind of needs to fit our, 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 our uh, um, context, I guess. And so here is a little context of how we are. And I, I think this is pretty much this way throughout the Midwest. It's just kind of a chart that shows when we get our precipitation. And we're usually the wettest in May and June. And then, you know, it starts. And then the rains we do get July and August um, evaporate pretty quickly because of just the, the amount of heat that we get. July and August is when our July, August, early September is when we get our hottest days. So, and that's when it starts tapering off. So I'm constantly looking for new crops that we can grow in the winter. And then it, that also fits our weed profile. You know, back to that other screen there, you know, oats really fit our weed profile because um, it, it doesn't give uh, kosha or, or uh, the pigweed family, you know, uh, water hemp, uh, palmer amaranth, pigweed. doesn't give those weeds much chance to get established and get going. So um, these are crops that I choose and uh, that are just happen to also be really good cover crops, um, seeds. So selecting what fits a rainfall pattern. Um, so here's a list, and we've talked about these cover crops that I raised for seed, cereal rye, hairy vetch, oats, barley, peas, and buckwheat. Um, there's, I'm sure there's more um, to come. Um, I'm, I'm raising some uh, camelina this, this year, just as a, this will be a, for a commercial crop, cash crop. Um, I'm kind of excited about those as as a cover crop as I see it grow though. Um, so, but it's another crop that I've added into my rotation and we'll see how it goes. That upper left, left picture there is, happens to be the line between, um, I grew um, oats and this was my first attempt at hairy vetch. And this was an irrigated field, just really looking for an opportunity of something that will pay, pay the, you know, our, we have high, high rents on our irrigated land. Um, so, it, you know, consequently, we think we can't raise anything but corn or soybeans because, you know, irrigated wheat doesn't pay hardly enough to pay the rent and that kind of stuff. So this was a crop that I ventured into just to see what it would do. And I, I planted oats with it for it to trellis up and it just kind of an idea of what what it will do when you put two crops together, cereal rye on the right, that was probably chin high on me. I'm, just under six foot tall and and so so basically had hairy vetch and, and oats that got nearly that tall so uh, when you have two crops competing against each other and uh, also running and companion with each other um, it it can actually enhance your yields and uh, improve uh, and so I tell forage guys this you know if you're if you're trying to grow something for forage this is a this is something to consider. So anyway, and then then there's the buckwheat, kind of a close up. Just uh, I took a lot of buckwheat pictures. I'm amazed with that plant. Um, it's it's a drought avoider. Um, it'll sit there and wait a long time for rain. I, I experienced that this last summer. I had planted it on some pivot corners and it, I mean, it it did fairly well with, with very, very little rainfall. So, <laughs> so Back to our cleaning and, and example of, so this is hairy vetch and oats and cereal rye that I, this is kind of a byproduct of cleaning. When I separate back to that spiral cleaner, when I separate the, there's a little bit of hairy vetch that rides along with the, with the oats and cereal rye that you're taking out. So this is a mixture of the three. These are seven weight cattle um, grazing in this stuff. And it's just amazing. And there again, last summer in, a very dry environment. So this is another thing that, you know, it all works together, uh, integrating the livestock in, into what we're doing. Um, 
it, you know, it leaves the nutrients there in the field and actually enhances the biology. Um, you know, the, the gut rumen on these cattle has a lot of, a lot of good biology to it. And so that's just one of another one of the things we're integrating into our regenerative system. So some of the special things, I guess, that uh, probably a lot of people don't do um, when they're raising crops. And, you know, so we're raising seed crops. So I think it's even more important, you know, um, just what we've talked about through this series, you know, increasing the biology, how some of that rides along in the seed and that kind of thing. So special things we do, number one thing I do is pray. Um, when you... Uh, see how some of this stuff has grown, especially in a no-till. You know, we're not planting in ideal conditions. As I showed you there earlier, I was planting in some pretty dry conditions. And, uh, you know, when you're driving around in four foot tall cane, you tend to say a little prayer when you're planting your wheat. <laughs> so anyway, especially when you're planning to take that off for hay and you know you're gonna leave, leave uh, fairly bare soil, not a lot of armor on it. So, uh, but seriously, um, you know, I've uh, become recently aware of how the Native Americans uh, did things, and, and they have actually a prayer ceremony or a, a, a blessing ceremony on their seed. And, and I think that's an important part. You know, when you see how some of this stuff grows, it, it's, it really is a miracle. And, and talking about a miracle down there on the right, that's, that's the Camelina. I planted that Valentine's Day. They say the planted a quarter inch deep, and I was planting in the corn, corn residue from the previous year trying to no-till in and plant a quarter inch deep. It's kind of gets you on the edge of your seat and, and uh, makes you think, what in the world am I doing out here? So um, chemicals and fertilizer, uh, very much reduced on those. Um, as I said earlier, you know, cover crops are expensive enough. Uh, we got to go throw a fertilizer out there to make them successful. It's just not going to pay. Um, and so, you know, that goes for a cover crop itself, but it also goes for raising the seed. You know, it, 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 it's a tight margin. And if I go spend money on fertilizer or chemicals, um, potentially not going to make any profit. So that's one reason to reduce. But but then the other reason that we talked about is just the biology, you know, just what I talked about, you know, even using the desiccant, how I don't even realize you could be killing the killing the endophytes or the, the biology that rides along with the seed. And, and I think we're we're even just beginning to discover how that works. No pesticides, no fungicides, and, and uh, very few herbicides. And like I said, they, these are an opportunity and a, uh, a necessity, um, kind of um, both. And the, the cover crops, raising them for seed uh, enhances my ability to do this. And it also um, uh, en enhances the necessity to do this. So it kind of all works together. It's kind of a um, once you get into regeneration, you know, just as I talked about, like the starfish, once, you know, I had a, a back surgery when I was younger and, and uh, when I got up and got started walking the, and my back got started feeling stronger, um, it started to heal quicker. And so that just snowballs on each other. Once you start to heal and you start to push and exercise and do some things, um, things pop up that you didn't even, results that you didn't even know you were going to get. Um, so, so those are some of the special things we do and, uh, also just the way we handle the seed. Um, a lot of what I do is, uh, I use a lot of gravity, um, when I'm cleaning. So I re reduce the amount of augers that we use and stuff like that, that, um, it just helps to not damage that seed. So those are some of the special things we do. And then now, so increasing biology, um, we add inoculants. Um, so that middle picture at the bottom was some barley that we just planted the other day. We mixed some, we mixed a little vermicompost in with it, just mix it in with the seed and drilled it. Um, so that's a very simple way. Um, I also use extracts, um, uh, compost extract when I'm, um, a lot of times I treat my seed, seed corn or seed beans with that. And, uh, a lot of times the things that go through the drill are easier just to, to mix the actual compost in with. Um, so lower left there, that's that's a hairy vetch. And that's one of my favorite pictures of hairy vetch. Uh, a lot of my pictures of plants are actually pictures of the roots, uh, my favorite ones. Uh, and so hairy vetch uh, can produce a lot of nitrogen. 
so that particular crop there I harvested and then the following year I raised uh, 187 bushel irrigated corn uh, with only 30 pounds of added in um, no no other uh, fertilizers added not even um, compost or anything like that so just kind of shows you know and there's a, there's another positive to uh, at raising these seeds um, that like I said continue on because the next year I actually had volunteer veg that I was planting into that actually had you know nitrogen stored in it so these things just kind of snowball off each other lower right there's some buckwheat that was grown in some very sandy soil and you just see the the soil structure that that's building um, and so you know trying to trying to get some of this biology to go right along with the seed is is uh, um, very important and uh, you know the epigenetics of improving these seeds as we go improving them to our conditions and uh, you know if we've got seed that'll grow in harsh conditions on low amount of water and uh, no added fertilizer and very few herbicides um, those are going to be the seed that I want to plant the coming year uh, the ones that have have thrived in that kind of condition the upper right hand there is um so that's actually some seed cleanings that I'm making a Johnson's food compost out of. Um, I make Johnson's food compost. Um, I do some thermophilic compost with some of my seed cleanings. And um, so we're messing around with some of that. The upper left there might think that's compost, but that's actually topsoil. Um, that was a spot where last fall my soybean had plugged up and it slid a little ways. And I got out to clean it and I was looking at that. and I'm like, man, that looks like compost. So to me, that's the ideal is, is when you can get your biology going to where you're building compost in the field and that's what you want. So, you know, growing quality seed um, and, and then the living roots at uh, 24-7, 365, you know, that field where the, the hairy vetch is grown and also the, uh, that, that comp looks like compost came out of the same field. And that's, that's the result of, uh, continuous growing cover crops since uh, um, 2018. So there's been something growing out there all the time. And, and a lot of times I'll uh, terminate those after the cash crop is actually up and growing. So um, there's no blank space in there. And I think that's very important for the, to keep the biology along for the ride. So, so then, uh, um, on our buckwheat and our hairy vetch crops, I've I've had beekeepers come in and um, and uh, bring bees and hope hoping to help with with pollination and and I've um, struggled to get to, I've had a, a couple of pretty good guys that were doing it and both of them have moved on or retired and so that's uh, something we've recently branched into ourselves is we're going to be getting our own bees and uh, we're uh, my daughter and I are working on that venture together. And, and there again, I think um, having quality pollination can really help um, increase yields without the need for, for uh, trying to do it with, with um, fertilizers. So that's, that's something else we've ventured into something special that we're, that we probably do that a lot of, a lot of people aren't doing. Um, and uh, I think there's, still more to be discovered on um, just quality crops being raised in more of a natural way um, that we don't even know yet. Um, maybe some some people do, um, you know, John Kemp listening to him and, and some of the others that talk about um, um, Dr. James White talking about the endophytes and, and those kind of things. Um, but I think there's still a lot to be learned about how these, how all these things interact. Um, so I'm kind of running right through here pretty quickly, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. Um, so I guess promote myself a little bit, my business. I, uh, like I said, I, gr I grow seeds for uh, green cover um, seed. And I also um, raise some for my own use for on the farm. And then we, we also do sell, sell some cover crop seed here. Um, we, uh, uh, green cover is 
has kind of become my number one supplier for for cover crop seeds and and it's been a great relationship and uh, um it's also one of the things that i've added is is i do uh, consulting and uh um so if you're interested in something like that it, it just seems like it pairs well with uh with the cover crops helping people decide you know what to plant and where and how it's going to help your soil and uh, so anyway those are my contacts um I guess I kind of rushed right through this and got through pretty quick, but uh, leave leave more time for discussion, I guess. Um, so um, these are these are some of the things I've done, and and I'm excited to talk to you all about it. So. No, thank you, Vance. We appreciate that. <clears throat> A great presentation there. Um, I'll wait for you to get back on screen here. <clears throat> And folks, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box. We've got a couple of questions in there, but uh, certainly have time for more. Um, there we go. So, yeah, great presentation, Vance. There I, we go. I, I want to, uh, I love the analogy with the starfish, and I kind of want to start there, I guess, because uh, it, it it is a, a great word picture of, you know, how something so badly damaged can regenerate itself. It's an amazing testimony to God's creation. And so I like I like that um, analogy, especially, you know, it's not going to recover if it's out on the interstate. And so I kind of wrote down here, you know, number one, you need to remove the cause or remove the issues that were creating the degeneration. And then number two, provide the healing environment. And, and I really like those two steps. So um uh, where do you think you're at on you know step one step two you know removing the harmful effects and then number two providing the environment for that thing to regenerate itself um so we're not i guess i'm still getting off the interstate we're uh we're still using some herbicides um we've eliminated completely insecticide fungicide um now that being said, when I when I plant like a triple stack corn, it's hard to get it without treatment. Um, so we're still using some seed treatments that have insecticides and fungicides. But other than that, um, just about everything. And a lot of my stuff is non-GMO that's non-treated also. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to lean more towards the biologicals for those those things. But uh, um, yeah, eliminated. Um, we've eliminated using chemical fertilizers for phosphate um and uh lowered my nitrogen rates um and as when we first started out we probably were actually using more water than ever when we first started using cover crops on irrigated land but now i'm to the point where where i think i'm over the hump where it's starting to save water and that's kind of one of my passions is you know this stuff ain't going to be around forever so trying to build our soil to where we can get by with very little irrigation to no irrigation at some point, hopefully. So yeah, we're, we're still at the point of trying to eliminate some of the, some of the damage, but um, I feel like, you know, putting back some of that biology. Um, so every time I, I get a chance, I'm pumping a compost extract through the pivot. I treat my seed with it, you know, just trying to throw that biology back out there and give it a chance. And, uh, you know, we're doing things to feed it too. And so, you know, yeah. A lot, of, well, a lot of work to be done yet, but we're we're on a good we're on a good start. So. I, I, th I think you're 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 off the interstate. You're at least over into the median. Or <laughs> but you know, I think that's a great point because how many people and and you know, you and I included at times forget about that first step. We want to jump to step two, and so we plant a cover crop or we use a biological trying to help provide that healing environment, but we haven't taken away the things that are causing the harm in the first place and and again neither you or i are saying that you know you have to completely eliminate everything and be you know certified organic to really make this work or make a very healthy environment and system but the the goal would be to minimize those chemical disturbances as much as possible so yeah i i like that because sometimes we just want to jump to the healing and we don't take care of the things that are causing the harm in the first place yeah, I guess one of the things I, I kind of failed to mention was I had that picture of the of the oats that had the brassica mix growing in it. So that is coming up on almost two years of no chemical, no fertilizer used whatsoever. 
because the last time I sprayed it would have been in 2022 when I sprayed my corn the last time. And so I've gone clear through an oats crop and a cover crop, and now I'll be putting corn again again and again this spring and it'll get it'll go back to using herbicides but i feel like the the herbicides are a lot more effective after after you take a couple of years off and so that's that's some of my strategy is is you, you know just reducing that giving it a rest giving it a, a regen year per se um so yeah kind of a intermittent herbicide fast if you will you know to right. to Kind of heal the land there so yeah i like that um i do want to talk a little bit about water you've mentioned it multiple times of course you know in western nebraska that's a pretty big deal uh how much of your ground is irrigated versus dry land and then talk a little bit more about you know you said you know you need to be able to use less water you know what does that look like you know what does your water use look like compared to maybe your neighbors okay so my answer to your question now is would it be a lot different than it would have been a year ago. So I recently made some changes in my farm, turned some more ground over to my sons. I would typically have been over the last 20 years, I was about half irrigated and half, half non-irrigated. And this last year I turned some ground over. And so I'm down to about a fourth of my acres are irrigated and then three fourths of it are non-irrigated. Um, gone back to just farming mostly ground that I rent and, uh, or that I own. And, uh, um, you know, just finding out a lot of this, a lot of this regenerative stuff is, is a long-term investment. And, and, uh, so kind of, uh, changed, changed my practice quite a bit in that, in that realm here just this last year. Um, but as far as water savings, um, it probably doesn't look a lot different. I mean, you're, you're not going to see it. You're not going to drive by and see it, but uh, water meters are probably more telling the story about, like I said, at first, when I first started the first couple of years, when I was really pushing cover crops and keeping 24 seven, especially through the drought, we were using more water. But, but now I just did a, I just did a video uh, with my daughter the other day on water infiltration. And, and I was amazed at this this one field that I've pushed since 2018. I mean, I, we did an inch and a half in three minutes. So, you know, when the rains do come, we're going to be a lot more efficient. You're going to be ready when that so, big, that big one comes. We're, we're, re we're ready for rain. <laughs> and those are usually the, those are usually the, the, the rains that come in a drought. Some I've seen it rain 10 inches in in yeah. one day, you know, and, uh, I'm not saying we're going to capture all that, but we're going to try. We're going to try to get all we can. That's a and that's a pretty big deal when you've only been averaging ten inches here for the last right. few years. So, and you know, these last three years we haven't gotten those. We, you know, this last year, I think our biggest rain was six tenths. Yeah. You know, and uh, so yeah, they came nice and we're good and we're very timely, but uh, we we're pretty short. So it, it, it's been really strange how we haven't gotten those which it's just different. Yeah, so. well, it's coming. It's coming. Um, I also want to go back. You made a note about, you know, the some of the destructive things or some of the harmful things. You mentioned the traffic across the field. And I'm assuming that you're referring to compaction that is caused by that big equipment and lots of traffic. Talk just a little bit about how you see the compaction, you know, hurting the soil, hurting the soil system, hurting your productivity, and how regenerative practices can kind of help reverse that. Okay, so I do a lot of, you know, just going out there with a probe and you can feel it. Um, you can feel when you hit that, you got to force a little harder to force through that. And I, I think it's 200 PSI, um, where the roots will actually just stop growing through that and they'll grow horizontally because of the lack of oxygen. It's just kind of that magic number. And so when your roots start growing horizontally, um, you just, you're going to use a lot of energy to do that. Sure. They might go find a crack and go on down, but they're going to, they're going to use a lot of energy to try to find that. And they're going to be lacking for nutrients for amount of time before they find that. But if you, if you can get your, get your soil structure to where your roots are going straight down, 
um, and you're getting air into your soil, air is one of the number one ingredients that we need, water and air for, our, and uh, if you can get water and air to go down, um, that's, that's just, that's just the building blocks for everything else. So, Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, a lot of times we think that water is a limiting factor and, and oftentimes it is, there's no doubt about it, but sometimes uh, it, yeah, it's oxygen. That's a limiting factor. Cause you're right. Roots will never grow deeper than where there's oxygen. And so if you've got, it not necessarily it's going to be your whole field, but parts of your field where you've compacted so much that the oxygen can't get very deep, then your roots can't get very deep. Your water infiltration can't get deep. And and now you're farming six inches of soil instead of four feet. You know, we've got, we've got some no-till non air especially non-irrigated land that's been no-tilled for, oh, 20 years probably or more. And you can still find those little tillage layers in there. So it, it lasts for a long time unless you, you know, it, it, it takes a while. And, and that's one of the things that we found was that the cover crops really helped us to start turning that around. The, the no-till just, it's a good system, but it wasn't, it wasn't doing everything we needed it to do. So Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, comment for me here and then we'll we'll go to some some questions here but you mentioned the concept of no kill relay cropping uh maybe go into a little bit more detail just uh, explain again what relay cropping is how that's different than poly cropping or intercropping and then also talk about you know what the no kill strategy is there oh sorry so i I guess I like in the the, re the relay. What I call a relay is, is, you know, when you when you think about a relay, there's 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 a time period there where both runners are running together to make the transfer of that baton. And so I guess I look at crops the same way. You might have a, a crop living with your other one for a bit, and until it hands off the baton of the biology and and some of those nutrients and stuff, that they're going to actually live in that transfer zone for together for a little bit. That's what I, that's kind of how I define the, the relay cropping myself. Um, I mean, I, I know there's guys pushing it farther than that, but, but for me, a lot of times it's just that, that time period where the, they're both growing simultaneously for a couple of weeks until you move on to your next crop. Um, and, uh, I've, I've really looked at, uh, it seems like, um, we, we've all for several years, I've, I've put in cover crops behind, you know, just following the combine basically when I harvest wheat. And it just seems like that's the hottest environment in the world, uh, a cut wheat field or a summer fallow field. And uh, so um, looking at backing that up and that, that oats picture was an example of that where you're backing that up and getting that growing while, while your cash crop is still green and growing. And, and it's got a bit more of a, uh, it's got the shade and it's, it's got a little bit more of that that moisture that lower more moisture cycle small uh, moisture cycle going on down there give it a chance to get germinated before it's blasted with 100 degree heat and no and no uh uh no real biome there i guess to to get it um shade you know to cool it so yeah and and so it's a it's a no kill system because both <laughs> crops are reaching physiological maturity and you're harvesting them for a grain crop, correct? Yeah. So like that one example where I was drilling into that, that multi-species, you know, that I drilled the wheat while that was still green and growing, drilled that wheat in there. And then we harvested that off as hay. Um, after three field crops in a row, I felt like I needed something. So we harvested hay, which I don't like to do, but, but that was kind of the example. And then that'll, that'll just be a cover crop. That wheat's not, I mean that's a pretty picture, but it's not, it's not going to make very good wheat. So that's just a cover crop for the the right. next the next crop up. Gotcha. It's yeah. just an example, just kind of an example of how you can get that going. Um, you know, like I said, was drilling in there with no dust. Um, it was dry. It was dry enough to have dust, but you know, it's just uh, it's just a different environment in there. So. Well, I know it's been windy out there as well as here, so there's been plenty of dust in the air where people aren't taking care of the ground, and that's that's just pretty obvious to anybody who uh, has eyes and a brain to see that driving down the road. So uh, let's go to a few questions from the audience here. Teron <coughs> asking, uh, 
first of all, he says, thank you for sharing your information. He appreciates that. Uh, with your, you talked about having volunteer Harry Vetch and Rye Seed. Does that ever get a good enough stand where you just let it roll over and take it again for another seed crop the next year? Uh, you know, do, have you ever seen that or done that? Yes, my very best uh, Harry Vetch crop was um, volunteer from the previous year. So the very first year I planted it, I had oats and and uh, um, the Harry Vetch and harvested that. And, and it was successful enough that, um, but then the next year I, I needed some rye. So I planted that patch of rye thinking, well, we'll harvest that rye and then I'll hopefully go back in there with something else. And, uh, you know, with the irrigated, you almost got to do two crops to make up for, you know, that it, it just our rents are so high and our inputs are so high on irrigated land that we have to almost, if, if I do a, if I do a seed crop, I almost got to do two. Yeah. But so I planted the rye in there, grazed it a little bit. And then the, the hairy vets just absolutely took over. And I was like, well, that's, that's fine. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> It's worth more than Harry. It's more than worth more than rye anyway. So it, it pretty well overtook the rye, and and it was a very good, a very good vetch crop. So yes, I've had that. So to kind of follow up on that, he's asking: Do you do you feel like if you do that, do you unintentionally select for hard seed on Harry vetch by utilizing volunteer? I don't think so, um, because my har harvest losses on the on the vetch were were big enough um that i you know i i suppose it's possible if that were um seed from two or three or four years old but it, where it was the previous harvest loss i i don't really see that being an issue yeah no i i i would totally agree it'd be no different than if you just replanted the same seed that you had harvested so and, you know, I think vetch has a bad reputation. There's certainly some vetch that has a lot of hard seed. You know, most of it anymore, though, it's getting down lower and lower. And they're developing new varieties of vetch that will have less and less. So I think the hard seed issue is not as big a deal as it used to be, but still something to, to keep in mind. Um, well, one more thing on that. I guess for me, some of the other epigenetic things that we're seeing, winter hardiness and that kind of stuff are far outweigh the hard seed um so i mean that's the stuff that that's the stuff that made it over winter you know with being just kind of broadcast i yeah. mean it's not even been in an ideal germination condition so yeah. you want something that you can broadcast over the top of a field or something and have it survive the winter um that epigenetics to me is more even more of a big deal than the, than the hard seed yeah no, for sure, it, the epigenetics, and, you know, we talked about that week one with John Kempf, is such an important part of you know, getting it to adapt to the, the conditions you want. The other suggestion that I would have for people is if if you are worried about hard seed in your hairy vetch, and, and this, this costs a little bit of money to do, or at least it ties up money for a little bit, buy your vetch a year ahead of when you're going to plant it, because if it sets in your shed for a year, you'll lose the vast majority of the hard seed out of there. Just the freeze thaw cycles, uh, the time that it sets there. Uh, vetch will always, vetch seed always gets better with time as far as having less hard dormant seed. So that'd be one solution that you could do. Uh, Teron has one last question for you, Vance. And he's, and, and I actually had wondered about this too. You were talking about, you know, growing peas with the rye. You mentioned that you ran out of seed and you used wheat. Were you talking about then you had peas with the wheat or you had wheat with the rye? I had peas with the wheat. The peas okay. that were with the wheat seem to do really well. And that's so that's something I'm wanting to try again um, is to try the peas with with the wheat. Yeah. Um, one of the I didn't throw it in the slide, but so last last summer I had some some uh soybeans non-irrigated soybeans that kind of hung in there forever the good part was they they really hung in there and had we gotten some of those typical early september rains i think it really would have but the bad part was is i really want to get my wheat going so i i have a drill that will only drill between the rows like for intercropping in between corn rows or or basically for in between 30 inch rows so i went in there and did my wheat 
so I've got some of those sweet strips now that I'm wanting to try a few of those things on. Um, but it, and, uh, so I'm going to be doing some trials of, I probably won't do the peas this year, but just we're so dry. Um, you know, I did a little, had a little camelina seed left over that I did and it's pretty much dead. It's just so dry, but it's something I want to try in the future. And there again, that same, that same concept of relaying a little bit. So, yeah. Dennis is asking, he'd just like to hear more about, you know, where you're growing the poly crops together and, you know, planting methods. So you've mentioned, you know, vetch and rye, peas and rye, peas and wheat. Are are you typically planting those all together or do you have to plant them twice? Is there adjustments that you have to make on your planting equipment or, you know, what do you look at when you try to say, well, I think I can grow these two things together. What What are important considerations there? So the the vetch and rye um, typically just gets drilled together. Um, the let's see um, that picture of the rye and the peas was just a, a separate planting. I went, I did the peas first, and I was wanting to put, I put those in super deep. Yeah, and then I came back in, just moved over with the drill and uh, planted the rye, you know, a week or two later. Um, so, yeah, I do a lot with that row spacing. I, re I really like that row spacing. I, I, my 10 inch drill, I've actually taken it, plug every, I have the ability to plug every third row. And then the ones that aren't plugged, I've slid together to six. And so, and that picture I showed of the corn, um, I've been trying to perfect rolling that rolling that with an in roll roller and the narrower the strip the better because sometimes you miss i mean auto steers neat but it's not perfect so yeah just a little bit of everything uh, but i i use that row spacing a lot um and so if i'm looking at two different crops i'll come back in and but yeah it, it is just depends what makes the most sense yeah so, and, then and then I i've actually got a three point one that that i can carry that that I can drive between the rows and not drive on anything. And, and so I've got the two, two machines for that. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John wants to know how you are applying your extract to the seed. Okay. So I have a, I just built a, um, a IBC tote extractor. It's just got a pump that recirculates and has a couple of screen that fit like in a around a five gallon bucket. Um, that hang in there and it just circulates and so I make it in there and then I just attach a little a little um, fitting on there and I just use a piece of like um, eighth inch uh, micro tube coming out of there and it just pumps in and I just dump it from one pro box to another it's pretty high tech I just <laughs> just uh, you know just kind of hose it down as it goes that or I'll use a, a, a liquid uh, inoculator on a seed tender but like my seed corn I like to do it ahead of time you know when it gets delivered here in the shop, I'll, you know, here in a, in a week or two, I'll probably be, I don't plant corn super early. So, you know, it'll be a week or two probably ahead of, of corn planting when I, when I treat the seed, but it's, it's super simple. I mean, I tell guys that's the best way to start. And then um, I do have the capability to do it in furrow with the planter. Um, but um, sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. I had, it's set up on my drill, but it's super hard to keep in our no-till with our tough uh, corn stalks and stuff. It's hard to keep them going. So I, I've i just basically switched to just doing the compost in the in, mixed in the seed on the, on the drill. It's just so hard to keep the liquid system going on a drill. <clears throat> Hoses always want to be jumping off, don't they, when you're dragging up through all the stalks? Yeah. Uh, Lonnie is asking about the type of cleaner you use for separating your companion crops. I know you mentioned, you know, the spirals, uh, but what type of cleaner do you have ahead of the spirals? So the one in the picture there was a, it's the clipper style. It was uh, made by uh, um, somebody that does a, a copy of a clipper and it's just a small, it's a 2B style and about 50, 60 bushel an hour is about what it does. Um, and then I also have, I've got what's called a Metra. It's more of what I would call a grain cleaner. 
and it, it'll grade. And so I use it in combination sometimes just to knock the, you know, knock the chaff and, and a lot of the stuff out of it. So it, it totally depends on how it looks coming in off the combine. Um, usually vetch is kind of a mess, especially growing it with a, a poly crop. I mean, it, it's just really hard to set the machine and, and we're trying to set it not to, not to have a lot of crop loss. Um, so we'll, we'll end up doing a lot of cleaning. Sometimes if I'm separating hairy vetch, sometimes that'll, that'll go through one machine multiple times it'll go through that that batch or air machine a couple of times it'll go through the spiral a couple of times um and sometimes maybe a pre-clean with the it, it just depends on the combination what it looks like it's uh grain cleaning is kind of an interesting thing it it, it changes it it really does it's it can change yeah from one year to the next quite a bit. It, it's as much of an art as a science for sure. And, and and I think I want to just make this point to people. It's not as much about the equipment that you have, but your ability to be patient and understand how the equipment works and how to run stuff through. Because what Vance has is nothing fancy. It's nothing huge. But because he's patient, he's willing to run it multiple times. Uh, and he's experienced in knowing how to set it he has a very good high quality product. We can, we can attest to that. Uh, but yeah, it's not a just run it through once and we're ready to sell it kind of an operation there. So uh, one last question from the audience here, an anonymous attendee is asking, have you noticed any other benefits from your transition, like more wildlife, more birds, you know, just kind of, you know, you mentioned that you live very close to what you farm, <clears throat> which many of us probably do. You know, have you noticed environmental benefits? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the birds. I mean, I go, so I go out in my fields, like, especially I like to walk through, well, like that, that uh, buckwheat that I use as my background. I mean, you can just hear it. It's just alive. It's buzzing. I mean, you can see the butterflies and the bees and the birds and it, it is, you can definitely see it. Yeah. Um, probably um we had we did the thousand farms um with uh oh i'm drawing a blank jonathan lundgren yeah the Beck dice's foundation mm -hmm. and they were pumped they were out walking through my cornfield and they found a tiger beetle and i'm like yeah they bring me this bag of bugs and they're like they're super pumped all these bugs they found and they're like well we've never found a tiger beetle in a cornfield before and i was like i was like i thought we'd really find a lot more bugs than what they found but they were they were pumped. Yeah, they so, are pumped, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I I kind of nerd out about that kind of stuff too. Just one example: I had a uh, two years ago we had barn swallows show up here, and I think it's because of the drought. They typically, you know, they make those mud nests, and they're typically down on the creek a mile from here. And we didn't have any, so they were up around here. I think getting mud out of the pivot tracks and stuff. So they were building them on the side of my house and everything. And I'm like, "Oh, that's cool. We're not gonna have mosquitoes." But I joked that I went from uh, middle of the afternoon saying this is cool, what googling what do uh, barn swallows eat to 4 a.m. having them building nests under my window and chirping under my window at 4 a.m. googling <laughs> what what eats barn swallows. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's a circle of life for sure. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's great. Well, just kind of to wrap things up here, Vance, again, thank you so much. I, I want to just, I want to close and then I'll give you kind of a final word here, but I just really liked one of those last slides that you showed, you know, where you showed that your seed crops have very few herbicides, no fungicides, no insecticides, no chemical fertilizers, and that you pray over them. I, I just think that's that's pretty cool. Uh, that That's a good combination, of, uh, a, a good type of seed to have. So I just really appreciate your diligence to uh, all of those things in, in growing seed for us, for our customers, for your customers, and for, you know, all, all the people all over. So uh, last word to you, Vance, uh, you know, closing comments, or if somebody wants to get started kind of down this path, do you have any quick advice for <laughs> Well, it's 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 a journey. It's not something I've I've learned the hard way. You don't just uh, you don't just uh, quit things cold turkey. 
Um, it's but really once it starts to go, it it really snowballs, and it, you can see some pretty real cool things. I've seen some very cool things even in the drought here. That man, if that works when it's dry, it's going to ignite when we start getting some rains. Um, and like I said, those those drought rains are are uh, they're big ones sometimes, and and I I always my trying to sound optimistic when I'm kind of down down and out statement is every day every dry day it goes by we're a day closer to our next big rain so that's uh kind of what keeps us going is just working towards for the future so yeah well again thank you we appreciate that appreciate you sharing your uh wisdom and experience there and and folks next week will be our last week in this series uh, our guest um, will be Ed Baumgartner. Uh, Ed is going to be an interesting character. He's going to be different because he's growing seed corn. He's a seed corn grower. He's been growing seed corn, developing seed corn genetics since he was 17. And uh, I'll, I'll let him tell you how old he is. But it's he's been doing it for many, many years. He spent lots of time in Puerto Rico uh, in production fields in the off season down there. But what makes him unique is that his company, uh, Bass Hybrids, he's doing all non-GMO, and he's growing the seed corn in regenerative environments. And we've 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 talked before about how you know so many of the modern varieties are grown in non-regenerative environments. So epigenetically, it doesn't fit the systems that we're wanting. Uh, so Vance, this may be of interest to you too because uh, everything is is non-GMO, non-treated, unless you request it to be treated. Uh, and grown in more of a regenerative environment, not only grown, but bred, selected in more of a regenerative environment. So I thought it'd be interesting to close the, the series with, you know, a hybrid seed grower like that uh, to get perspective from that part of the industry. We don't sell that seed, uh, so this is going to be different. It's not seed that we're selling through our company or our business, but it's going to give big industry perspective on seed growing. So hope you can join us next week for that. That will be the conclusion of this webinar series. Uh, we're just very grateful for everybody's time and attention uh, and everybody have a great day. Thanks again, Vance. Thank you.